one of the things I'd like to go back to, if you turn with me to Judges. Do you remember we were in Judges? And I read out on, on Sunday uh, the scripture in Judges 9, but let's just read it again. It says this in verse 8 of Judges 9. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And I brought out when I was here how that basically... Uh, one of the worst things that ever happens in any church is people that want to supervise, control, manipulate, command other people. That is not ministry. That is false. Because in the end, that comes from a totally wrong seat. And you find it here. It says this, uh, the trees went forth to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. And the olive tree said to them, Should I leave my fatness, wherewith by me they honor God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? And the trees said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. And the fi but the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit? and go to be promoted over the trees. Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou, and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, to go to be promoted over the trees? Three things that are noticeable, and that is the question that the trees immediately respond with. The olive tree said, Should I leave my fatness? The fig tree said, should I forsake my sweetness? And the vine said, should I leave my wine? If a man is going to rule over anyone, he can only do so by leaving what God called him to do. And anywhere you go, that is the problem. Uh, true ministry gets to a point where a man wants to rule and wants power. And once he wants power, then he has to leave what is real and what he should do in order con to control others. Now the fig tree said, hey, should I leave? No way. Because, you see, the thing about a fig tree is a fig, pro fig tree produces figs. People can eat of figs. But if you leave that, what's the fig tree useful for? Because the sustenance and the life comes from the figs. And so often people leave what God would be fruitful in their lives doing because they want a position, they want power. You come to the, um, there's the fig tree, and there's the olive. The olive says, well, should I leave? Should I forsake what I do? And there is a sense in which a man has to forsake his real ministry in order to rule. Because you can't set up dominion and kingdoms without forsaking what you're really called to do. Because the truth is, anointing and power brings life, but it doesn't bring control. A fig tree, if you eat figs from a fig tree, the fig tree doesn't control you. After you've taken the figs, I mean, it might control your bowels next day. Um, <clears throat> but, <laughs> you know what they say about prunes, don't you? They're like missionaries. They go down into the dark interiors and clean them out. Um, but, <laughs> you... <laughs> 
sorry about that. Um, but but you you <laughs> uh, you might look at figs and the, once you've eaten them and you've tasted the fruit, um, basically there's no control. Then you look at the uh, olive, the olives. Once, once you've tasted it and you've eaten, they have no control. Same with the vine and the wine. And, and that is what ministry is giving. Ministry is ministering. But when it comes to ministry, no longer ministering, but controlling. And that is the spirit that's so dangerous in any church. That's why I hate these house groups with little house group leaders and little Hitlers who think they've got some ministry. Oh, God's given me a ministry, you know. Or elders, they, they appoint them elders. God deliver us. We have no elders, no deacons, no problems. We have people that function. But once you give a man control, you get problems. But if only he would carry on doing what would bless people rather than trying to do what would control people, the body of Christ would be an enriched place. But there is something in man that he has to say, I will ascend, I will rule. And man wants to rule. And the strange thing is, man also wants to be ruled over. You'd prefer someone to tell you what to do rather than making your own decision. You'd prefer someone to advise you what to do rather than make your own decision. In the end, you've got to govern your life. But there's only one king of kings and lord of lords. His name is Jesus. He's the head of the church. They might have had a ministry, though some of them might totally doubt it, but they try to control. And once a person tries to control, you have problems. And they become like the last one, which is here. And um, then said all the trees unto the bramble, come now and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, If in truth you anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. You know, a bramble doesn't produce fruit. It just chokes out life. If you watch brambles going up, they'll choke out the life of a tree. That's all they do. And God never intended anyone to reign and rule. And the idea of, of ruleship in the sense of the church of Jesus Christ is totally wrong. You are responsible for your life. No one else is responsible for you but you. You make a mess of your life, that's your fault. I heard once some of these apostles say, ah, oh, well, if your elder tells you to do something and it's wrong, it's their responsibility before God, not yours. That's a load of hogwash. You are responsible for what you do. Don't ever believe it's the devil, it's not, and don't believe it's someone else. You are responsible for you. And you have to answer for your actions. And God will hold you responsible. There are a lot of people giving a lot of advice, and a lot of it's just stupid advice. Now, if you take it, that's your problem. But you had a choice. You could take it or leave it. Couldn't you? There are principles in God. If you violate those principles, you do so at your peril. But understand, that's your fault. You chose to do it. No one ever forced you to do it. You made willful choices to go wrong. And wrong you went. And then in the end, you find everything goes wrong. But it's your choice. And I find that, really, I enjoy going to places like Belgium. I go there, I leave there. It's just lovely to see all the miracles. People want to know, when are you going back? When can we have more meetings? When can we get a bigger hall? When can we do this? When can we do that? And in the end, I say, well, we'll sort it out sometime. And, and leave it at that and walk out. Now... It's good they can come and receive the fruit of life. Because the tree of life yields its fruit every month. And the leaves are for the healing of the nations. 
and we're there just to give. What we're not there to do is try and set up, dominate, or take dominion. And the vine tree said it, the olive tree said it, the fig tree said it. And that's how you keep a church in real life, is when you keep people out who want control. Because no one has control. They shouldn't have. Um, a church and faith must work by love. If it works by control and authority and austerity, then it's a mess. It says that love's easily entreated, doesn't provoke, it's not puffed up, vaunteth not itself. The spirit of love isn't one that wants to grab hold and have a position. Hey. I know what God's called me to do. I know what I can do. And that's what I do. That's my bag of tea. Now someone else can do something else. Well, that's fine. But as far as I'm concerned, God sent me to heal the sick, deliver the captive, tell people you can be free. But not to bring people into church to try and get them and say, well, now you're here. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. We better have an indoctrination class to get you into an indoctrination then we better have a discipleship class so you know when to cough and not to cough. Then we'll have another class that teaches you how to give. Then we'll have another class that prepares you for ministry. And then we'll have another class that prepares you for deeper life. And then we'll have another class for the prof prophets, get you in the prophetic ministry. It's a load of hogwash. Jesus never did it, so why should we? And if we look at the role of Jesus I mean he was just incredible he just got on with what he was sent to do he healed the sick delivered the captives but he never said to people now look here people I'm God I'm the son of God you're to do exactly what I say now he had the right to say it didn't he but he didn't and when the disciples said well where do you live he said well come and see so they followed him. But he never ever controlled them. When they said, look, what you say is a hard saying, who can hear it? He said, well, do you want to go away? Fine. When he spoke to the rich young man, he said, one thing thou lackest. When the rich young man went away, he didn't say, look, you've got to come back and do what I say. He just let him go. And when a church learns the ability not to hold people, but to bless people. And when the people of God learn that there's freedom in life, it's so much easier. Because if you learn the other way, you have to forsake fruit bearing in order to control. Now, I would rather see fruit and life than control. And what I explained to them in Belgium is, and in Holland was, hey, the people that want to control are always the people that haven't got life. They abandon it. And then how do they build something? Why? They get a system. And then they promote people. Have you noticed how these little house groups, you've got house group leaders, you know, and then they want leaders of 10, leaders of 50, leaders of 100, leaders of 1,000. They want to have everyone gets a position. And if they think anyone's going to cause trouble, they promote them. But that's not God. That's not the way it is in the church of God because it doesn't bless anyone doing that. And, and most of these mutton heads who become house group leaders are a pain to everyone. And God deliver us from it. The Bible makes clear what it should be. There's a lot of people take offense at it. They say, oh, well, you know, but you've got to have someone in charge and you've got to have covering and you've got to have someone over you and you've got to... Well, who wants a bramble over the top of them? I mean, what food or sustenance? It'll choke the life out of you in the end. In the end, you won't be able to move this way or that way without getting hurt. Have you ever tried to walk through brambles? And that is the way it is. These people try and grab you and you mustn't do this and you mustn't do that and you must be here and you must be uh, and 
They even tell people what meetings they can go to, which house group they've got to belong to, who's going to be their elder. I think, oh, rubbish. It's wrong. It's the wrong way of living. Same with, as as I said to them, it's amazing in Holland, they can have a row over who's in charge of making the coffee. I, I mean, you know, that's it. One woman got upset, it's her machine, she's going to be in charge of it. And you know, the, the other one didn't make it as well as she did and you can off, you know. Um, and you find there's a fight over making coffee. And then the treasurer, how dare anyone else go and look for a new building. I'm the one who's got the right to look for the building because I'm the treasurer. I don't need anyone else to go. I don't want anyone else to suggest where I'll decide where... And there she is. She's built a little kingdom. Coffee, mate. And then the bookstore. And there's someone who decides, I'm in charge. I'll decide. And, and you get all these little, you know, they, they've suddenly got a position. And then there was one woman, and, and what I did, when I first went there, she got up on a guitar and she decided to sing... And I could see if that woman was allowed, she'd kill everything. So I've had no singing in the meetings at all for two years. Because I know there's a bramble just waiting to arise, plonk it down, and she sings with a guitar, and oh, it's deadly. It's like deadly nightshade, let alone a bramble. And and I I said, no. But suddenly... It's amazing how little things people want to control. Another guy, you know, my job to see, you know, the the leaflets that go on the seats. Another woman, she wanted to do the newspaper advertising. Now the trouble is she gets the dates wrong, she gets the venues wrong, (laughs) she gets the spelling wrong. She puts it in the wrong blinking paper at the wrong date after the events happened. But she's in charge of it. And you think, dear God, brambles. It's amazing how people want to be in charge and they walk around, Lord of all they survey, instead of getting on and doing something constructive and useful. It's amazing how many people want to be a foreman instead of a worker. It's amazing how many people think they've got the ability to control and to organize when they do nothing themselves. There's nothing worse than having someone who does nothing telling you what to do. You begin to resent it. Why? Because you think, heck, that's a bramble. You don't understand why, but you think, it doesn't matter how nicely they ask you, why don't they get off their fat backside and do something? You know what I mean? Or, it's just logic, really, isn't it? And who cares who makes the coffee? And who cares whose machine? And then they had, when they were moving from one hall to the other, the, the machine belonged to, so then they had a discussion, which type of machine should they buy? And they were nearly having fist fights. Because the woman who made the coffee decided she was going to have one type of machine and the other one said it was too expensive, they wanted a different type of machine and the third one said we need a bigger machine and all of that uh, because we might grow in size so we want enough so we can make 200 cups of coffee in one go. And everyone else thought that was ridiculous and they couldn't afford it. And, and I go there and there's a civil war. And they said to me, what do I think about it? I said, well, where are you going to meet? Well, we don't know yet. Has it got a kitchen where you're going? Well, I don't know. Well, if it has, might it not have its own facility? Oh, I suppose it could. Well, why don't a lot of you just shut up? Well, I suppose that's sensible, really. Mind you, it was mainly women. But the men were as bad. And it's amazing, isn't it? how people want control over someone else's life Uh, you know you better do this you ought to do that in the end my view of it is well 
People are going to make their own mistakes and they're going to do their own thing. You try and advise them, you try and warn them, but in the end they're going to dump themselves whether you like it or not. So you might as well let them dump themselves. Eventually, if they're sensible enough, they'll come to the end of themselves. They'll be miserable enough, messed up enough, that they'll become honest and ask for help. Then you can tell them what the principles of God are, but after that, they've got to make the choice of whether they actually do it. Because in the end, if they don't make their own choice, they're not going to change. Man is the most stubborn creature on earth. When the seed of sin came in, the seed of rebellion came in, and people just don't want to do what they're told. And when God tells them, and a word of God has principles there, Man doesn't want to do it. So what makes you think, if God can't get man to do as he's told, what makes you think that you can get someone to do as they're told? You can't. If God doesn't do a miracle in a man's life, forget it. He'll never do what's right. He really won't. So the best thing to do is be a fruit bearer. Now if you bear fruit, people that eat of the fruit and say, oh, that's tasty. How do you get that fruit? Simple. You've got to live this way. Simple as that. I found it a bit embarrassing when, when there were beautiful miracles. People got healed. And they said, is it all right to pray to Mary? I thought, oh, dear God. <laughs> Holy Ghost. How could I get around this? You, know, uh, you didn't speak of the Blessed Mother. I said, I left her at home. Thank God. Um, no. <laughs> she still tries to control me, you know. There's nowhere the bra comes from. But um, it's another story. The, the, <laughs> but Mary and the saints, and you know, well, they don't understand, but they could see the miracles. I'd say it's only in Jesus' name. Mary can't help you, and she's no virgin. That used to get to him. <laughs> Tell a Catholic she's no virgin. Mary isn't a virgin, you see, because after Jesus was born, Jesus had brothers and sisters. She was, she was a virgin when she conceived of the Holy Ghost. After that, Joseph had his fun, and they had kids. The Bible says so. And, and therefore, you know, to say it's the Virgin Mary is false. She wasn't a virgin any longer. Uh, and do understand that. Uh, children, and on the day of um, Pentecost, she was one of those in the upper room. It says in Acts, if you've ever noticed, that she was in the upper room. She needed to be filled with the Holy Ghost the same as everyone else. And she was. Uh, she didn't. Uh, separate. John looked after her. The Apostle John um, took her into his house and looked after her. Uh, but let me make it plain: she was just she wasn't the mother of God. She was the mother of Jesus, the man Jesus. She didn't. She couldn't have been the mother of God because <laughs> she'd have had to have pre-existed to have been the mother of God. That's ridiculous. But in human flesh, she was the mother of Jesus, the man Jesus. She was to do with the humanity of Christ, not with the divinity of Christ. No way could she have ever been part of the divinity. She never was. And these Catholics try to explain to me that Mary had not actually died. She'd gone home and she was the queen of heaven. I said, the only queens I know are queers. Um, <laughs> And they've got a lot of them in Holland. <laughs> and God's against them. Uh, is against that filthy lifestyle. One Catholic came up to me and he said, um, he said, you know, he said, um, you can't blame people for being homosexual. It's in their hormones. I said, that's a load of rubbish. It's sin. God says it's sin and I believe what God says. Oh, he says... Well, I said, even the Pope condemns homosexuality. Didn't you know that? And he said, yeah. And I said, and you call yourself a good Catholic? You're a disgrace to the church. So, yeah. 
<laughs> oh dear. There are many things that the Catholics say that are good. Um, it's just that it's just paganism and idolatry when it comes to the candles and the statues. There, there was um, this Italian guy built a house and he built this house and he, 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 you know, this was in America and he went to look, look round the house and he, he walked round and the architect who built it for him according to his construction was really pleased with it and he, he walked round the house and he said, um, he said uh, excuse me for asking he said but there's no statues there and the architect said, oh, oh I, I'm very sorry about that. And he said, where do you want them? And he said, I, I want one in every room. He said, I, I want a statue in every room. And so the architect said, well, all right, fine. So he, the man went away and he went and he made alcoves with beautiful lights. You know, got Mary in one place, crucifix in all around the house. And... Then he invited him back and he thought, now he's going to be thrilled with this, you know, Catholic, Italian. So when he came back, the chap walked around and he said, what have you done? What have you done? And I said, well, I did what you said. You said you wanted statues. He said, no, 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 he said, not statues. You know, stout you. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Stat you. <laughs> Telephone. <laughs> Skip it. It was a wasted joke. It was a wa <laughs> I won't tell jokes like that. <laughs> when it takes time to explain it, you can. We're better off in the scriptures here in Judges. <laughs> you know. Why do people want to be? Why do people want to be anointed king? Why do people want to rule? Because the anointed cherub decided that he would rule. I will sit on the sides of the north. I will ascend. And it is that seed above everything else that we need to avoid. We need, as a church, to be a people that realizes that the whole of the teaching that has come in is wrong. It never was that way. Uh, they used to have campaigns, people would come, people would get healed. The church of God would grow. But there was never this austere kind of control. Came in and always when revival ceases, people want to control things. Whitfield was one of the greatest revivalist preachers. When Wesley came along, he wanted to control. And John Wesley and, um, really wiped out the Methodist revival. The man of faith was Whitfield. They drove him out of the country. He had to go over to New England. And he preached round in America. But the real man of power and faith was Whitfield. And the organizer who got him in house groups and got him in their prayer groups was Wesley. And he killed off the revival. And he called Whitfield a fiend from hell. Mind you, he changed his writing. Thirty years after his death, they cleaned up the Methodist books. And they took out all the references. But if you get um, one of his journals, just with the last author's corrections before his death, you'll find that John Wesley used to call Whitfield a fiend from hell, a devil that said alive, awful things. He really was anti-Whitfield. And he killed off the revival. And Methodism today is dead because of the whole system they bought in. But the average person doesn't understand that. The average person isn't a historian. He doesn't look at it and find out. Same with um, George Fox. George Fox... James Nalier, Isaac Pennington, were the tremendous um, ministries. William Penn were first generation Quakers. They were filled with the Holy Ghost, moved of God, and were really used of God. And then 
as their lives begin to come to an end, they, they came in a movement called quietism. And then people try to control what God had done sovereignly. And the Quakers moved in all the gifts of the Spirit. Um, George Fox used to cast out devils, heal the sick, see tremendous miracles. And yet, as the movement went down, before he died, they'd gone into the wrong thing. Um, Isaac Pennington was a real man of God. James Naylor was one of the greatest preachers, they say, after Whitfield that had ever lived. And he would speak sometimes for three or four hours, and people would just fall under the power. And tremendous revival came. So the Puritans, who by that time had gone into real bondage, they got hold of him. And because he was such a great preacher, they forged a letter saying that he claimed he was Jesus Christ. And, and they got him, and they stripped him naked, and they bored his tongue through with a red-hot poker. And then they made him ride backwards as they whipped him through the town of Bristol. And it says, you know, the man that ha had the job of boring his tongue through with a red-hot poker, after he'd done it, James Naylor leaned over and kissed him on the cheek. They had a spirit of life. There was something real. And the move was a tremendous move of God. But it went wrong when people, instead of producing fruit, try to rule. And you look at the Salvation Army. Salvation Army, Booth was tremendous. But it was when Clipbourne Booth came that the Marichal, who was one of the most gifted women who went into Paris and really moved in revival power. And she ended up going across to America, of course, and she was at the city of God, Zion City, that they built there with, I can't remember the man's name, it begins with D. Um, goes out of my mind at the moment. But she was tremendously used of God. But she was thrown out of the Salvation Army. She was called a heretic because she wouldn't come under the control of the so-called leadership, the apostles, so-called the leaders. The Salvation Army, Clipborn Booth and those excommunicated her. And she was used of God all over the world. The Mary Shell. If you ever get a chance in a second hand bookshop and you see a book on the Mary Shell, you ought to get it. Sell your shirt for it. And Mary Slessor was another one. And when you look through history, you'll always see that God starts with a move, but when man starts to try and control it, when people want to take authority, come into subjection, come into submission, all the wrong spirit starts to work. And it's devilish. That's what kills the real life of God, out of a move of God. When people take control because they say, anoint us king. We don't need that. We don't need a people anointed king. We need Jesus, and we need to exalt him, lift him up, proclaim him, and tell people, hey, there's freedom in Christ. There's freedom and joy and liberty in our God. And, and all through history, you can look and see how it happened. You know, in the early um, Brethren movement, it went well. J.M. Darby and Stone and those, to begin with, they went well. And there began to be a move of God. And then they set up their eldership move. And then they killed it. And then you've got Big Jim Taylor, who, you know, birthed the exclusive brethren. And he was trying to explain to people when I think he was 70-odd. And someone walked in and he was there lying in bed with an 18-year-old nurse. And he was saying he was like King David. He'd taken her into bed to warm him. I'm not sure which part she was warming but that finished the move and people began to see control was wrong. When you give a man absolute power, you get corruption. No one should have power over others. It's wrong. The church of God must be a place where blessing is, where healing is, where freedom is, where joy is, where free expression is. What it shouldn't be is a place 
that's all regimented. That is not God. Never has been, never will be. People say, well, you can't run a church like that. I remember years ago, 17 odd years ago. No, it was less than that. It was about 12 years ago. These mutton heads from B Birmingham came down to see me. And they sat in my thing at the Bell House, in my lounge. And they said, right, they said, we want you to tell us who's in charge of your building committee. I said, we don't have one. Well, who's in charge of your finance committee? Well, we don't have one. Well, who's in charge of your board of governors of the school? We don't have one. Well, who's in charge of the diaconate? We don't have one. Well, how do you run things? Well, God runs it. Yeah, but you've got to live in the real world. You need committees. You can't run a place like this without committees. And I said, I know you can't. Well, they said, Who, who's on them? I said, we don't have any. So they said, well, how does it work? I said, I don't know. They said, well, who organized it all? I said, I don't know. They said, well, how do you manage? I said, I'm not sure. I said, well, who sets the budget? I said, we don't have one. I said, but no one can run things without a budget. I said, we do. He said, but that's irrational and illogical. I said, I know. I said, well, how are you going to survive? I said, I don't know. I said, if you don't get control of things, it'll get out of hand. I said, I suppose so. So well, what are you going to do when it gets out of hand? I said, I'll leave it in his hand. I said, but you can't do it like that, son. I said, thank you. But I have, and we will, and we shall. I said, but surely you must know how much you get in every year. I said, no. It was funny, actually, because they got, Carolyn was the treasurer. They got the treasurer and they said, to, you know, got it without me there. And they said, tell me, they said, when did Michael last look at the books? And she said, well, it was a little while ago. So she said, well, when? Well, it was quite a little while ago. <laughs> when exactly was it? Well, actually, he never has. <laughs> How long have you been going? Well, we've been going over seven, I think it was about nine years by then. And he's never looked at a book, no. Well, how do you do things? Well, if he feels it's God's will, we get on with it and God sends the money. But that's irrational. Doesn't he ever want to know how much is that? No. Well, how does it work? Well, God's always been faithful. And he always has. You know, you can either do things the world's way, the devil's way, or you can put everything into God's hands and say, hey, come on, it's your church, you said you'd build it. Lord, take charge, and you can follow him. What he does, you can do. What you see the Father do, that's what you do. And, and it becomes a very easy way of living. Very hard to run it with organization. Because have you ever tried to organize anyone? And you can't get anyone to really, no one really can be organized if they don't want to be, can they? Can they? So why try? Why not just stick to what God said we should do? We should all be fruit bearers so other people can eat of the fruit. Other people can be filled. Other people can be blessed. And we should be givers, not takers. We should bless. Last thing you ever want to do is control. God deliver us from people who want to be brambles. Amen? Do you understand that scripture? If you ever get someone who says, who's over you, show them Judges chapter 9. So there you are. The thing was, you see, after Gideon, that they wanted to decide who was going to take charge. Everyone wants to know who's going to rule. 
To me, the last thing we ever need in the church of God is people that govern. We need people that bless. The last thing we need is people that want to control. There are principles in God that are valuable, uh, but once you teach them, it's up to a person whether he does it or not. You can never control another person. Because if you're honest about it, you find it hard enough to control yourself, don't you? Or don't you? So why do you think you can control other people? It's just stupid. God's in charge. Let him rule still. Jesus is Lord. Let him govern your life. There are things that I see that are wrong. They're wrong. Things I think person stupid to do that but let the stupid be stupid still I mean you can't you, you can tell them not to I've told people not to and I'll tell you what even if you turn them round today within three months they'll go back and still do the stupid thing they were going to do and you turn them round there and three months later they'll still do it and then you go and they come for advice and you say look there's and you think they're going to turn, but they're back to it. So you might just as well ignore it and just let them get on with it. Now when they crash, hopefully they'll come back and say, hey. And if they don't, well, you wouldn't have saved them anyway. I find it's a lot of, saves a lot of energy. A lot of energy if you just think, well, that's it. That's the easiest way to be in the church. Be a fruit bearer. Turn to the person next to you and say, I don't want you to be a bramble. You're prickly enough already. <laughs> Bear fruit. It's that simple. Isn't it? You know, the word of God makes it plain. I'm amazed that no discipleship people actually discover that scripture in the Bible. Oh, they want to govern people and rule people and tell people. Number of times I used to have people coming to this church in the early days and they'd walk in the door and you always knew you got trouble. They'd come up to you and they got that sour look on their face. Who's your covering? I used to say, St. Michael. <laughs> so what do you mean? I said, I'm Michael and I get my underclothes from Marks and Spencers. <laughs> no, who's your spiritual covering? Pratt's. I said, I don't have one. Jesus doesn't keep you, now unto him who's able to keep you from falling. And he jolly well isn't an elder. No one can keep you. If you're going to go wrong, you're going to go wrong. If God doesn't keep you, you're knackered. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're knackered if God doesn't keep you. <laughs> and that's the truth. You've had it. There's no way you can live without God keeping you, is there? Huh? Well, praise God. Anyway, we had a good time in Belgium. I'm looking forward to going back. I've got a wagon now. If you notice a new car outside my drive, it's not my car, but it's there. It's, it's a van. It's a nice, comfortable van. Because I, I'm an old man now, and I felt I needed to go in luxury. And so I bought a, a wagon so that when we go over to Belgium and Holland, which we do once a month, it's one long journey. It's got nice reclining seats. And it's nice. And you're all welcome to have a look at it, but you can't ride it. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it, it's comfortable. And it's a church vehicle, so you can't go in it. Um, <laughs> It's, it's there to do a job, which is to get the people that want to go to Belgium and go on these things back and forth. Because we go over on the hovercraft, although this time coming back, the hovercraft wouldn't hover because there was gales in the channel, so we came back on the ferry. 
and Anki got to know the ladies very well. Um, she kept going there. Finally, she came out of this small room and said, I've nothing left. <laughs> I didn't understand. I'd had a good breakfast, you know, and enjoyed my lunch, and it didn't affect me, fortunately, although I got a bit worried at one point. You know. <laughs> so, dear, oh dear, there's nothing worse than seeing everyone else feeling ill, and you wonder whether you're going to join them. Then you rebuke it. Say, stomach, keep your food. But we, 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 then when we got to this side, we got to Dover, they couldn't get in the harbour because the gale was too strong and there was a boat that couldn't get out and we couldn't get in. So we had to sail round in circles, well, steam round in circles while they waited for it to subside a bit so we could get in the wretched place to get off the ferry. And it took about an hour, didn't it? An hour, hour and a half just so we could get in to get off. But I knew I was safe. I knew I was safe. God was on my side. Why didn't I stand up on the forecastle of the ship and rebuke the wind and the waves? <laughs> I'll tell you why I didn't. Because I wasn't sure that words would go forth. I thought my dinner might, so I stayed inside. <laughs> Stayed inside, but we got home <laughs> safe. And but I enjoyed going. And it's a privilege to see God doing miracles. It really is. I wish you can. If, if the video did come out, one of the batteries doesn't work on the one we took, Norm. Um, uh, so we only got a bit of it. One of the wretched batteries wouldn't work. But what we got, I hope, will be good. So you can all see it. Rob took it, so it's probably their feet. Um, I, I don't know. We'll see. I don't know what he took. But anyway, it was good time. And it's thrilling to see in a new place that people will just flock when they hear the miracles. And they come and they're desperate. They've seen charismatics. They've seen discipleship. They haven't seen miracles. Miracles is what we're about. And we always want to tell people it's not a form of godliness, it's the power of godliness we believe in. Amen? Well, we're going to gather on Friday. And um, what's t it is Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, uh, Friday is the beginning of the Bible school. Is that right, Ruthie? Bible school begins on Friday. Also, Dr. Margaret will be with us sometime this weekend. Um, that's Benson Idahoza's wife. She's larger than life. And you'll find, you'll find out what I mean when she speaks. She's a character. And um, she'll be with us over the weekend. Hmm? Oh, there's a baptism on Sunday. Who for? There's a baptism. Anyone not being baptized as believer in water, it's best to get it done now because if you wait a little longer in the year, when we're breaking the ice off the swimming pool, you might regret not having volunteered earlier. Uh, the swimming pool is heated, but I can't guarantee the air around it. Um, but we have one baptism service, probably the last one. Yeah, probably Peter says the last one. As he's going to be in the water with Andrew. Because I take the scripture that Paul said, I thank God I baptized none of you, so I, I stay outside the water. Except the house of Chloe, and I, I haven't got a Chloe in the church, so I never did it. Ah, that'll be good. Anyway, the prayer request, let's lift them up to the Lord. Father, I just thank you. You always hear us. And Lord Jesus, I just pray in your great name, break every chain, loose every fetter. Let your life flow and healing go to them, I pray. And Lord, let us hear a 
good report of the good things you've done. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. And so shall it ever be.